Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Drew Harvell. Drew Harvell is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell University and resident at Friday Harbor Labs in Washington, San Juan Island. She's author of over 170 scientific publications and author of the award-winning A Sea of Glass and just released Ocean Outbreak. Her research has taken her from the tropical waters of Hawaii to Mexico to Indonesia, Australia, and East Africa. Her current work is on ocean health in temperate waters of the Salish Sea. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being in the program. Well, hi, Derek. Thanks a lot. I'm delighted to be joining you here. Oh, thanks. Um, so who are sea stars? And let's start with them. Who are sea stars, and what has been happening to them the past decade? Well, you know, my background is as an invertebrate biologist and a marine ecologist. And so I study a lot of the spineless critters in the ocean that kind of drive the big ecological interactions and make make things happen. Uh, and sea stars actually are a really important component of our ocean ecosystems. Some of your listeners might usually call them starfish but they're not actually fish, so scientists have been more recently calling them sea stars. And that's just that whole group of beautiful um, critters that are star-shaped in the ocean. And the reason they get a lot of attention is because some of them are what we've called keystone predators, and that was a term that was coined Wow, maybe 50 years ago by a former mentor of mine, Bob Payne, to describe the ecological importance and the, and the fact that sea stars in fairly low numbers can control what the seascape looks like, um, just because they're voracious predators. They're kind of like the lions of the deep and they eat a lot of their prey and can control their numbers. Um, we're one of the, a main focus of my new book, Ocean Outbreak, uh, is about one of the largest disease outbreaks we've had in the ocean, which affects sea stars on the West Coast and expanded to some of our other coasts. Um, back up just a little bit. And um, who, whom, whom do sea stars eat primarily? Uh, yeah, so who, whom do they eat? And how does that... Uh, like one reason the buffalo are called a keystone species is because their wallows end up becoming habitat for everybody else. The same with prairie dogs. Um, and and so so can you tell to me just a little bit more about about that, their status as keystone or not their status but their their role as keystone species? Oh uh, yeah, that that great question. Well. In the waters that I'm working in now, which we call the Salish Sea, which includes Puget Sound and the waters north of there to the top of Vancouver Island, so into British Columbia, there are about 85 different species of sea stars in, on the books that might be in our waters. Sometimes some of them are rare, some of them might be gone, but, you know, there's a lot of different ones. And, I mean, they all eat different things, so... Our very common intertidal star, the one that, you know, anybody on the West Coast would have seen is called the ochre star. And that's actually the one that was originally called the keystone species. And that one eats lots and lots of mussels or clams if they can get them, but sometimes they'll eat snails or chitons. So, uh, but they're, they're capable of controlling the whole level of the mussel bed. One of the other stars that we've worked on is called the sunflower star, and that lives subtitally, and it's the largest star on the planet. It's the size of a manhole cover and has 24 arms, and that one eats lots of clams, but also sea urchins. And so in places where it's abundant, you don't find as many sea urchins because they can control their populations. And similarly, when you take that star away, sea urchins can become uh, much more populous. Uh, some of the other stars are stars that eat sponges, um, all, all kinds of, you know, different critters in the ocean. 
And when you take the, the urchin thing, because I think about that, that urchins, if I'm correct, eat, uh, what, what I've heard about them is that they, they eat a lot of kelp. And so without the sea stars, there can be an overpopulation of sea urchins, which can lead to a degradation of kelp forests. Do I have that correct? Yeah, Derek, you do. And that's actually the subject of a lot of interest and concern right now because the sea star wasting disease epidemic that started in 2013, so that's six years ago, um, pretty much wiped out populations of the sunflower star from Mexico to Alaska. And uh, in the last couple of years, in particular locations, particularly in Central California and Northern California, there have been massive outbreaks of sea urchins caused by the decline of the sunflower star. And so it's an example of, you know, an ecological interaction really controlling, um, the, you know, the distribution of a major habitat, the kelp beds. And those kelp beds, of course, are important because they're habitat for a lot of our nearshore fisheries, uh, abalone, crabs, and um, other organisms. And so uh, the demise or the denuding of those kelp beds by the urchins uh, is causing economic impacts and is of great concern. That makes me think a lot of the role of, of wolves. And, you know, since they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, that has improved uh, trout habitat and insect habitat because the uh, without wolves the grazers elk deer browsers got uh, really lazy and would hang around the, the riverbeds and that meant that there was not a uh, the next generation of willows etc were not able to get started uh, which meant the degradation of uh, uh, oh, I can't the word, um, the habitat next to a stream and riparian zones. And so then the wolves came back in that chased the, the deer and the elk out of the best habitat and the uh, trees were able to recover, which meant beavers could come back in and they could improve the habitat for the fish. So it's kind of weird. You wouldn't think there's a relationship between wolves and fish, but there is. And it sounds the same that, that it sounds like you said earlier, they act like lions. They it sounds like wolves too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's very common in on both land and under the sea for major predators to have an enormous impact on all of what we call the trophic levels below them. And so this is another, there's a word for it. It's called a trophic cascade. Ecologists like to have terms and, uh, that trophic cascade can be run by either a sea star or a wolf or in some cases sea otters too. So uh, there's a lot more general examples of that. So you mentioned sea star wasting disease. Can you talk about that please? Yeah. Um, so as a marine ecologist who specializes in disease, so you, some people call me a disease ecologist and, and specifically infectious disease, I've been running a network uh, called a research coordination network of disease ecologists to study the different outbreaks in the ocean. And so we've been focused on critters from oysters to seagrass to corals to dolphins to uh, uh, to sea stars and and turtles. So, you know, there are lots of organisms in the oceans where there have been big outbreaks. But, you know, the sea star wasting disease outbreak that began in 2013 was a very unusual one in that it uh, started quite suddenly and unexpectedly. And it ended up being bigger than had than we any of us had seen before. And by bigger, I mean that it affected more different species of stars. So, for example, there were over 20 species that. Uh, we're dying in what we call a multi-host outbreak. And the geographic range was unusual in that it spread all the way from Mexico uh, up into northern Alaska. 
Um, the outbreak may have begun two years earlier on the East Coast uh, and eventually would extend uh, further into the Pacific, uh, into waters of Asia. So it's been called the largest disease outbreak of marine or ocean-related wildlife uh, because of that. And so what we initially saw were reports of stars um, dying on the Olympic Peninsula and north of Vancouver and Howe Sound. And the initial reports were from from divers who saw vast numbers of the sunflower star dying in kind of extreme grisly ways. So their arms were falling off, uh, their uh, organs were spilling out of their body, and they were dying in really high numbers. And uh, that began in June and August of 2013. By October of 2013, uh, the epidemic had spread and was again unusual in that all three of the major aquariums uh, on the West Coast, so that's the Vancouver Aquarium, the Seattle Aquarium, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium, reported within two weeks of each other massive mortality of all of their captive sea stars. And so that got everybody's attention because some of those Many of those popul- um, collections were over 20 years old. These stars are pretty long-lived, and so that had never happened before. And so that kind of added to the concern about what uh, what was going on with this outbreak. So we started working on it in December in Seattle when there was a massive um, spread of mortality and dead stars showing up on people's beaches and um, we began doing our surveys then. Well, actually I actually have another, another, I want to talk a lot more about the, the disease, but before we do that, I just want to clarify a little bit. So when we have 20 different species of sea stars, um, if we made that, so would, would that be the equivalent on land of, would, would they be related to each other? Would that be like 20 different species of primates getting the same disease or 20 different species of how closely, sorry this is a really ignorant question, but how closely are sea stars related to each other? Compare them to humans, is it like humans and uh, gorillas, humans and chimpanzees, humans and lemurs? How, I mean, how close? Did you, I'm sorry again for the terribly ignorant question. Wow. <laughs> You know, it's a little bit of a hard question because I'm an invertebrate biologist, so I'm not really that expert on the relationships among human and primate groups. Um, and so I could really be making a mistake here by saying, um, be saying what I'm saying, but I'll give this a try. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are lots of different classes of, uh, uh, different groups of sea stars that the different species fall into. So there's a lot of variation that's covered by those 20 species that are affected. So they weren't just the 20 that were most, um, most closely related. And I suppose it certainly might be, let's say, so that I'm a little bit safe on this, it certainly could be like 20 different species of gorilla, right? There's a lot of different kinds of gorillas. And so uh, it's as if most of your gorilla species um, all became sick from the same thing. And, you know, we know uh, that there are diseases, there are other diseases that are called what we call multi-host um, pathogens or diseases. And um, perhaps one of the really good examples for anybody that knows about frogs uh, is there's an outbreak of uh, a fungal disease called the chytrid fungus that's causing massive extinctions of frogs worldwide. And they're estimated to be perhaps over 200 species of frogs that have been decimated and maybe driven to extinction. Sometimes it's hard to know when something's gone, if it's really gone, but definitely decimated. Um, or, for example, another example with birds is avian malaria caused 
extinctions of multiple bird species in the Hawaiian Islands. And so, again, you know, to have a disease that affects multiple species is not uncommon. And then just to kind of go on and on a little bit about this, there are also diseases that humans share called uh, with wildlife called zoonoses. Um, and so, uh, I mean, rabies, for example, would be one of those. Um, so... I, I, does that clarify a little bit more what you want? Uh, yeah. Uh, how, what is the current status of the sea star wasting disease? Has it run its course and they're recovering or is it continuing to decimate or what, 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 what's the status? No, it's continuing. So we're, we are now six years into this. It's 2019, and this started in 2013. Uh, in the year following the start of the outbreak, we lost between 70 and 90 percent of the animals in the intertidal. So those are the ones that we can reach at low tide and count. Uh, of the ones in the the subtitle, those are the ones that can only be reached by, by divers or, or dredging or, or some kind of sampling. Uh, that massive sunflower star is, has been decimated well over 90 to 95 percent almost throughout its range. And unfortunately, the mortality continues. So I receive reports from from divers and samplers pretty regularly. And two weeks ago, there was um, 50% of that ochre star was reported to be affected by the wasting disease uh, on Whidbey Island, which is near near Seattle. Uh, we did surveys on the intertidal stars a couple of weeks ago, and they actually looked quite good. So we only saw one diseased individual out of I don't know, I guess maybe two or three hundred that we had we had counted. So that was good. But the numbers are still low. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of a tale of two stars is the way I like to talk about it, because um, some of our stars are looking better, the intertidal one. But the subtital giant sunflower star is not recovering and we're calling it imperiled across most of its range. And that. That star used to be as common as a robin. I mean, you would see it on every dive practically in our waters. And right now, the only place where we're really seeing healthy populations are up into Alaska, which is the, the northern part of its range. It's what we call an endemic species because it only lives on our coastline. And so if it doesn't return, then it will be sort of not present on our planet. Um, so we're very concerned, and we've actually – called a few meetings to discuss whether there are management actions that would be important uh, to aid recovery uh, of that species. But, of course, as long as the uh, disease agent continues in the water, there's not really a lot we can do uh, to aid recovery unless uh, we can find ways to bolster their resistance to disease. Before we talk about efforts to, um, to help the population recover, what, what do they believe or what is believed to be the agent of this illness? You know, Derek, that's that's a controversial topic right now. There are a lot of knowledge gaps surrounding the causative agent of this outbreak, um, partly because it's been very difficult to work on, partly because it's novel, partly because it seems to be something small like a virus that's poorly studied in the ocean. So we did experiments in 2014. This was work done by uh, a postdoc in my lab and, and one of my grad students to test uh, the what we would call the e efficacy of a viral-sized fraction on stars. And those were experiments to actually inject healthy stars with uh, a filtrate from the sick ones that was uh, only very small, smaller than 0.2 microns, which is typically virus-sized. And what we found in our experiments is that that uh, virus-sized fraction made stars sick and die. Uh, 
And then the controls for that are to heat kill that fraction so that it's, it's got all its same components, but it's no longer, it's no longer living. So those were really good, uh, well replicated experiments that provided strong evidence for the role of something in the virus size range. And to date, we don't really have evidence that that's not what it is. Uh, but we really wish that we could have run those experiments on more of the other species and continued to do work on it. Um, but there's very, there was very little funding for this kind of research. And, uh, it was, it's actually very difficult to do those experiments once all of the stars in all of our waters were infected. So it only kind of works well to do those experiments with clean populations. Uh, so, uh, so in summary, just to say uh, our best evidence is that there's a, a virus sized microorganism causing the disease. You said that there, there are still healthy populations in Alaska of that, I believe it's called sunflower species. And um, what about areas, are you seeing any areas where there seems to be, where there seems to be some sort of recovery uh, or some sort of resistance developing to, to this disease? Well, we think the fact, e even though there aren't huge rebounds in our intertidal populations of the ochre star, the fact that there are stable numbers on the on the shore and that we're seeing quite a few of them does suggest that they must have some level of resistance or that at least the survivors do. So I think there's, you know, reasonable evidence for some resistance in some of these species. The sunflower star, though, that's not the case. We haven't seen large numbers of them recovering or remaining uh, on the shore, at least in uh, our southern waters in um the continental U.S. Now, up in Alaska, water's a lot colder. And so, for example, north of Ketchumik Bay, the waters are colder than nine degrees. And uh, since temperature is also a factor in the susceptibility of these stars to the disease, we don't really know if it's just that the water's so cold, the disease isn't effective, or if it's actually just not there. But those stars are doing pretty well. Um, one Sea star question before we start talking about warming water. Uh, that's what is the what's the typical life cycle? I'm really wondering, are the purple ochres that you're? Or, I'm sorry, I'm so bad with nomenclature, but the 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 intertidal species you're seeing that are recovering some. What is their life cycle? Are these ones who have survived the initial onslaught, or are these new babies who have come on? How how fast do they grow from – and don't don't sea stars do a thing – how do they reproduce? Do, don't they, like, throw the sperm and throw the eggs into the water and hope they meet? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what they do. Uh, that, great question because uh, it, it's an interesting one. So there are male and female stars, and the male stars make sperm and the female stars make eggs. And as you say, they, they do what we call free spawn, which means they release, uh, uh, you know, their reproductive products into the water. And so somewhere in the water column, those meet, they make an embryo and that turns into a little, um, a juvenile, a, a little uh, larva, which then has to feed for four to six weeks in the plankton and grow up. And after that period where it's been feeding and gotten bigger and bigger, then it's ready to come back to the shore. And so they come back and they metamorphose into little, what we call juvenile starfish that are actually really quite tiny. They're only about, oh, I'm looking, uh, I would say maybe a half an inch or less when they settle onto the shoreline. And then those grow up and maybe between I don't know, four to six years later, they can become reproductive and then start to, you know, make more babies. So that said, that means that the ones we're seeing on the shore that, that are, oh, you know, six inches to 10 inches in diameter must be uh, survivors of the epidemic because uh, they're, they're certainly older than five or six years old. 
Uh, and then the little tiny ones, of course, would be the new, the new recruits. Um, so that, that's how we know that some of the stars we're seeing those, those intertidal ochre stars, um, must have survived the, uh, the outbreak. And are you seeing, for at least that species and some others, are you seeing a fair amount of recruitment or are the, the babies not coming back? Well, those patterns have been a little bit confusing because following the big outbreak, so in 2015 and even into 2016, there was huge recruitment uh, like like nobody had ever seen before. So many of those little recruits hit the shore and started to grow up, but then they just they didn't make it. Um, a lot of them didn't survive. And so we had a, there was a lot of hope when we first saw that recruitment that everything was going to be fine and this was just going to all be over. Um, but unfortunately, uh, those juveniles also succumbed, uh, uh, to the, to the outbreak. So not all of the new recruits are surviving, but some of them are. Again, before we move to the lar- larger effects of warming waters, um, what would be, uh, I know that the crystal ball is always cloudy, and especially when speaking to a scientist, the crystal ball is especially cloudy because of, you know, we prefer, I'm, I, I have a degree in physics too, um, you know, preferring to deal in sort of facts rather than projections. But um, what would be, what would be the most likely I guess two questions. Uh, without intervention, what, how do you see this moving forward? Probably sort of most likely scenarios. And second, what interventions are possible in the oceans? Again, leaving off stopping global warming for now. We'll, we'll talk about global warming in a moment. Yeah, global warming, stopping global warming would indeed help quite a lot. You're right. And we'll get to that. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience with managing disease in the ocean. Uh, on land, the typical management actions are to, uh, to cull. That is, you remove all the diseased individuals from a population and so they don't transmit as much disease. Or quarantine, so you keep the sick ones separate from the healthy ones. Or vaccinate, you develop vaccines that can be used uh, to fight against future disease. None of those are options in this case or for most of our ocean critters. And so I, in, in my book, Ocean Outbreak, I do talk about how we have a bigger problem in the oceans. One, we don't see these outbreaks coming. Uh, often we don't detect them as soon because they're under the water, so they're out of sight and out of mind. And then secondly, we have really very few options uh, for actually managing um, across the expanse of our oceans uh, when these kinds of outbreaks start. So we, we really don't have a lot of options for actively managing, especially in a case with an outbreak uh, like this that's a novel organism that we don't, we don't even really know for sure what it is. Um, so we're really, our hands are kind of tied on that. Uh, that said, um, we, we feel that the prospects are reasonably good that these intertidal stars are going to come back, that there's, there's evidence that some of them are resistance and the natural course of things. I mean, really, Derek, right? This is an age old battle between hosts and their diseases or parasites. And this has been going on for millennia. So one of the natural courses is that the host will develop resistance and we hope for that. Um, in the case of the sunflower star, where there is no evidence of that happening, um, there is the possibility that the current endangerment could lead to extinction. Um, we, we, we don't really, we don't think that's going to happen, but we can't, we can't rule that out. Uh, we are considering what kinds of recovery efforts could be helpful. So one of those is captive breeding. It turns out that it's not really that difficult to breed sea stars. Um, it's just a matter of fertilizing those sperm and eggs and growing up the babies. And so uh, there are efforts underway, actually right now, funded by the Nature Conservancy at Friday Harbor Laboratories uh, to, to begin the process of developing captive breeding for that sunflower star so that when 
the pathogen maybe becomes less virulent or less damaging or the host becomes resistant, uh, we would, we would actually have some captive populations to begin to, to restore or, or help along the natural process. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is investigating more the natural mechanisms of resistance. Oh my gosh, we do not know very much about how, uh, sea stars resist disease. You can imagine. And so that turns out to be an important knowledge gap. Uh, we need more information to um, uh, to begin to understand how natural resistance develops so that maybe we can help move it along with some kind of assisted evolution or assisted breeding. Um, and then finally, another big priority is more work on that causative agent, the actual microorganism that's responsible. Once we know um, exactly what virus that is, uh, there's a lot more potential for better surveillance. So what is, um, in your perspective, what is the role of warming waters in the spread of this particular disease? And then after that, I would like for you to open it up to your larger exploration of what warming oceans mean for ocean life in terms of the spread of infectious diseases, not just sea stars, but across across other species. Well, in the case mm -hmm. in the case of the sea star epidemic, the the largest declines were associated with warmer waters and we actually did lab experiments in the summer of 2014, so near the beginning of the outbreak to to grow that ochre star at four different temperatures in the lab and what we found is that at the warmer temperatures they they died faster and so while there was no real evidence that the initial outbreak was triggered by a warming event there's a lot of evidence that the warming events that followed made the made the damage or the mortality from the outbreak a lot worse than it would have been. So what I like to say is the warming really fueled probably a larger outbreak than we would have seen. Um, and we recently published a paper also about the level of mortality in that sunflower star. And even in the deeper waters, uh, when there, w there was anomalous warming, there were higher levels of mortality. So that's kind of our evidence that warming was associated with the magnitude of this outbreak. And of course, those years of 2015 and 16, our waters experienced what we call a major heat wave. So um, anomalous warming between two and six degrees uh, warmer than normal. And that was all the way up into Alaska. So do we think that the warmer waters make the disease agent uh, happier and uh, more um, populous, or do we think that the warmer waters stress the sea stars and make them more accessible to opportunistic uh, disease agents? Yeah, that, thank you for the very careful way you, you worded that, Derek. Uh, again, it's one of those areas where we have a pretty big knowledge gap. We, we can't say whether the warming uh, benefited the pathogen and made it what we would say more virulent or grew faster, or whether the warming partially stressed the host and made it more susceptible. So that's typically what we see in a host-pathogen interaction with warming is there's kind of a double whammy that it can both make the host more susceptible or stressed, and that it can give the microorganism an edge because, of course, these a lot of these microorganisms have such rapid turnover and rapid generation times, and a little bit of warming can fuel much faster growth. Um, and then there are even some viruses that uh, that are triggered by warming. They're they're totally not. They don't have any uh, action when when it's under colder temperatures and above a particular temperature. Uh, their activity gets triggered. And, and in this case, we don't really know. All we know 
is that things are much worse uh, with the survival of the stars under under warmer conditions. So one more quick thing before we switch to the larger global warming question is, is this also affecting uh, sea stars who lived in waters that were already warm? No. Uh, <laughs> some of your listeners may know about the crown of thorns star, which lives in Australia and is in a major pest because it eats coral and it can have its own population explosions that can decimate vast areas of coral reefs. So wouldn't it be nice if that was, that star had been affected? Oh no, that was the one that was totally resistant and for some reason, the, the tropical stars were not affected by this, so it was only sort of in the colder temperate waters, which I know sounds a little bit, um, I, don't, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but it is strange that here you have this sort of heat-fueled epidemic, but it's affecting temperate species and not tropical ones. How does this, um, we have about uh, 13, 14 minutes left. Uh, can you talk about well, can you can you talk about your book a little bit, Ocean Outbreak, and and also the um, the larger question of infectious infectious uh, of diseases of the relationship between global warming and disease outbreaks in marine environments. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about that. Um, a lot of our work has uh, we're ecologists, so a lot of the work in my lab has been with what we call either ecologically important species. Um, in some cases, they're foundation species like corals and coral reefs, or the work we're doing in the Pacific Northwest is with uh, seagrasses uh, or with uh, sea stars, which are keystone species. So we're always concerned about these disease outbreaks that uh, can really have ecological consequences and, and affect potentially the balance of our marine ecosystems and even the sustainability of those ecosystems. In addition, virtually all of the outbreaks we've worked on are things that are fueled by warming temperatures. And so uh, in the book Ocean Outbreak, I focus on only four major outbreaks. And the reason I did that is there were just, there are so many, almost every organism in the ocean you can think of has at some time or another had some kind of an outbreak and some of them have been very important. And so that was just too big a story to be able to talk about. So instead I decided to, to focus on four that were really important or that had gave us an unusual power to tell the story about the role of disease in marine ecosystems. And so the four I chose are corals, um, sea stars, abalone, uh, and salmon. And I chose each of those for a different reason. Uh, the corals we've worked on for many years, and in, in a way they're kind of the poster child for big impacts from disease of warming because many of your listeners probably are familiar with the big impacts caused called bleaching on coral reefs uh, caused by warming oceans that disrupt the symbiosis between corals and their uh, symbiotic algae. But the thing is, after that bleaching event, the corals are susceptible to uh, further bouts of infectious disease. And so that's um, kind of what we've been studying. And unfortunately, that's just they've been lethal, causing massive decline of coral cover around around the world. Um, in the case of sea stars, again, the point was to tell the story about a sudden unexpected outbreak that could affect so many species, and they could actually have ecological um, cascading effects. Uh, now, the case of the abalone, those that may be a little bit of a less familiar critter to some of your readers, but um, those are um, a one-shelled um, uh, shellfish that are really good to eat and there's a, quite a high diversity of them in the California coast and they used to be an important fishery. They've been driven almost, uh, well, well, they've been driven to endangerment by a combination of over harvesting and a disease. Uh, 
And the disease story is kind of interesting because it took almost 15 years to figure out what was the infectious agent causing massive mortality of over four different species uh, of these abalone. And um, these, uh, this is another case where these these marine organisms are now driven onto the endangered species list, um, partly by the effects of this disease agent that can affect multiple species. And I should say, just to back up about the corals, several of our Caribbean coral species are now on the endangered species list, also driven there by infectious disease. And then finally, uh, I wanted to talk about salmon because uh, they're important food for us humans. And also there have been large uh, global outbreaks, which we call pandemics, of an infectious virus that's taken out a lot of our cultivated salmon, which are the Atlantic salmon that are grown in big, uh, big fish farms. And so, uh, that is an outbreak that had huge economic, uh, implications and really even threatened the ability of, of farming these salmon until very interestingly, scientists figured out ways, uh, to control those outbreaks and to develop, start to develop vaccines and resistant salmon and better hygiene practices for, for growing up the salmon. Um, so th- those were the kind of the main, the main ones in that book. And then really the whole reason for writing this book was to not just catalog everything dying and talk about these grim stories, which really are pretty, pretty depressing, but let's start thinking about how we're going to clean things up and do a better job with the health of our oceans. And we've recently been doing uh, work in Indonesia and very sewage polluted waters um, near coral reefs, but that also have uh, seagrasses. And what we showed in our study several years ago is that seagrasses can um, reduce the levels of pathogenic bacteria by 50 percent, at least in those waters. And so it kind of gave us the idea that, wow, there's there's some natural marine habitats that have important um, hygiene or pathogen reducing services that are not only important for things like corals and sea stars, but probably humans, too, because some of these pathogenic bacteria are also dangerous for us. And so uh, there are very large knowledge gaps about. You know, how does these processes and transmission occur in the ocean? And there's a lot of room for innovation in understanding um, natural controls on some of these pathogens in the ocean. And so that's some of the work that we're doing now uh, in the waters of Puget Sound also to look at the, the ecosystem services for filtration and hygiene uh, of, uh, in this case, it would be our, our eelgrasses. So maybe this question but what is the actual mechanism i know this happens with with marshes too that, that there are places that cities arcata just i live in crescent city california on the coast and of california and out of here in arcata they they use a big marsh they integrate a marsh into their sewage treatment plan and it evidently cleans a lot of the the infectious agents out how does that actually work? So you have some, you have some, some infectious agent that is carried along in some poop, and then how does the the seagrass actually clean that out? What what, what happens? Um, great question. And you know, as you as you point out, Derek, this is this is not news that coastal vegetation can have important filtration services and clean clean our waters. Uh, what was new in our study is actually to identify, uh, that pathogens were, you know, which kinds of pathogens were actually removed from the water and, and, and how many of them and by kind of a natural ecosystem. Uh, and we don't yet know the mechanisms. We think there are four that are probably all operating and it's going to be exciting to pursue the question of, uh, their relative importance. But um, for one thing, in a lot of these seagrass beds, there are natural filter feeders. So there's a lot of clams and oysters and sponges and ascidians and um, uh, sea squirts that naturally will be filtering 
uh, some of these bacteria out of the water. And I should say we, we only did study bacteria. So that's the first, that's one level of defense. Secondly, the seagrass itself probably acts as a passive filter and captures or removes uh, a, a lot of bacteria. Third, the way that normal, um, you know, our septic systems work is by using oxygenation. And a lot of um, certainly the bacteria that are in, in human sewage are what we call anaerobic bacteria. They don't like oxygen. Oxygen is toxic. And so just the production of oxygen by these seagrass beds or coastal coastal um, vegetation can be very important for, for controlling levels of bacteria. And then finally, one of the, one of the sort of more innovative, huge knowledge gaps in this is the potential role of the actual microbiome of the seagrass itself. Now, probably a lot of your listeners have heard about how important the human microbiome is. That is the kind of bacteria that live in our gut. But all organisms have associated bacteria, some of which are very good. And so the, 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 the bacteria or the microbiome that live on, on the surface of those seagrasses can also be playing an important role in sort of doing in some of the bad ones. So, um, so anyway, in summary, there's, there are four p- potential mechanisms and we don't really know yet the relative importance of them. So we have maybe three or four minutes left. And before we do a wind down, I just have to say that even though you are, uh, very, very calm and very clear that this, this interview is scaring me almost as much perhaps as any interview I've ever done um, because of because the oceans are so big and they are changing and as you said we can't see a lot of them so there are a lot of changes that are perhaps happening that we don't have direct observation on and so I'm just finding this notion of a warming ocean and uh, pathogens, uh, some pathogens perhaps being encouraged by a warming ocean, I'm finding that very scary. Um, I think that's fair enough. Um, I think it's a potentially explosive problem, and that's, again, why I wrote this book is to you know, I mean, it's a it's a book written for a broad audience, I hope I hope some of your listeners will read it. Uh, and I think it is, I don't want to like panic people, but I do think it's a potentially scary, scary situation. It worries me a lot um, because I care deeply about the sustainability of our ocean ecosystems. And diseases, frankly, scare me because they have such, you know, explosive power and potential. And then when you start dealing with a ecosystem like the ocean where there aren't really very many boundaries or borders and it's impossible to control something once it gets in the ocean. I do think that we need to put a lot more resources into working on this problem of both studying how our inputs from land can be increasing diseases because as we've already said, once something gets in the ocean, you're kind of in a tough spot. There's not a lot to do. So I think that really raises the ante on being much more careful about what we put in the ocean, how much more careful we need to be about aquaculture. Uh, we have a major concern about feeding the future. Um, we have a, a lot of concern about having enough protein, and so that's driving more aquaculture in the ocean, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. What I am saying is vital is that under those conditions, we have to have absolutely stringent best practices uh, to be careful not to have spill over and infect our natural biota. Um, so, yeah, I think and then and then we're not going to be changing the warming a- anytime soon, uh, even if uh, which I hope we'll be dialing back the level of. Um, carbon dioxide emissions, but we still have a lot of warming in the pipeline. So we're going to be dealing with an increased level of disease outbreaks for quite some time. And so I think we need to up our game to be able to handle it better. Well, thank you so much for your incredibly important work in the world. 
and uh, thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Drew Harvell. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.